create cool things and to build really neat stuff and have some fun. Welcome to Timelines of Success, episode 268. We record this episode at the University of Reno Innovation Center. What a fabulous place and a great place for entrepreneurs to work. Today's guest is Steve Bell. Steve Bell is a entrepreneur from Silicon Valley. He makes his home now in Reno, Nevada. This episode is sponsored by Karen Conrad. For all your real estate needs in the greater Reno Tahoe area, go to karenconrad.com. Her phone number is 775-527-7021. Now, without further ado, let's get right into this episode. Well, Steve, welcome to Timelines. Thank you, Bill. We're Good the- to be here. We are at the Innovation Center, UNR's Innovation Center, which is a very nice building, and we're both looking at uh, becoming members here. First time I've ever set foot on the UNR campus. I moved here a year ago, Bill, and this is quite a little discovery. Very cool. It is very nice. Mm -hmm. Hey, so the first question I'm going to ask you today in this return to timelines is, tell me the story about Wi-Fi. We're talking a little bit about how Wi-Fi became to be called Wi-Fi. Okay, well, the engineers in the IEEE uh, develop a lot of standards. And uh, in 1991, they started meeting out in Hawaii. I was at the first meeting to develop a standard to take Ethernet onto the wireless media. And it was called 802.11. The first one was 802.11b. So it ran on 2.4 gigahertz. The radical idea was that you could get rid of the Cat5 twisted pair and run the thing in the ether wirelessly. And they wanted to use the ISM instrumentation, scientific and medical bands, which are unlicensed. So it's a really big deal that it's unlicensed. And so they started figuring out how to do the protocol and they decided on uh, the Aloha research from University of Hawaii, which is classic. Um, So they they started working on some very technical problems and ended up a thousand engineers spent about 10 years developing the dot 11 standard. So they were very protective of it, as you can understand. We're talking the best minds in the world at meeting every three months and developing this work product. So that happened and it became commercially feasible for the chipset companies to make a Wi-Fi interface for a computer. But what had happened in the prior generation of connectivity with regular Ethernet companies, big ones like National Semiconductor and AMD built chipsets and they obeyed the standard description perfectly. But for example, at National Semiconductor, where I worked at the time, it took them 26 major revisions of this $100 million chipset to get it to talk to the AMD chipset and other vendors. So they they needed interoperability. So what happened was a bunch of business guys like myself, in particular three of us, got together and said, let's form a program where we can test this 802.11 and make sure that all the chipsets and all the software from the different vendors will work together without hanging up this time. Let's don't have another disaster like that Ethernet thing where it takes five years to get it all to talk. And, and FDDI was actually a worse crisis in the networking industry. There was a big blow up at the San Jose Convention Center when the first FDDI ring was demonstrated. The whole network running the whole show locked up when AMD and National couldn't interoperate. So everyone knew this could be a big commercial disaster if they didn't have interoperability. But what happened was uh, I had established uh, a large-scale test lab called Silicon Valley Networking Lab at 2681 Zanker in the heart of Silicon Valley. And these two guys walked in my door. It was uh, Greg and Dave, the head of the Dot .11 committee, the technical guy. And then David Cohen was running the Wireless Ethernet Compatibility Alliance. And So they walked in the door and we started talking about this program and whether it could be done at my lab. And uh, about the third meeting, they came in and they had a letter from the engineers with all the energy invested into this program, developing the dot .11 standard. And they said, basically, you dirty business guys trying to make some green stuff, don't stop using the term Ethernet. We're going to sue you off the planet. (laughs) So it's understandable because it was theirs. You know, they spent 10 years working on that. And we said, well, okay, we use the word Ethernet, you know, and this is a commercial initiative between a lot of companies to try to make sure things interoperate. So they're right, you know, let's go fix it. We need a new name. So David came back a few days later and he and his wife had been having a glass of wine and relaxing and she came up with this idea and basically he said, Greg and Steve, now sit down. I want to give you the pitch. See if you like this. So he goes, okay, you know, high fidelity was really big in the 50s and 60s. How about wireless fidelity, Wi-Fi, it'll be a household name. And I go, 
that's pretty good, you know. But I don't know about the household name thing. But in Silicon Valley, you never know. It could be. So the thing was, David insisted it has to have a hyphen because it's two words. Y dash phi. So for about 10 years, every time I saw a hotel without the hyphen, I would email it to David because it really annoyed him so that he could tell him to put the hyphen in. <laughs> but yeah, there were a lot of good people in the uh, in the Wi-Fi Alliance, which is what we re renamed it to. Um, key people like Phil Ballinger, uh, engineering people, marketing people from all the best companies. And they had a logo commissioned that uh, came out kind of funny that they still use today. It's like a unique trademark of Wi-Fi certification. And I ended up, because of the financial pressures that brought on our lab, I had three companies trying to acquire us. I ended up selling it to HP uh, right at the turn of the century. And um, when HP and Agilent split, uh, four days later, it was uh, Agilent acquires SVNL. It was their first transaction. And I was very lucky to be mentored by uh, Chuck Akin for two years, who actually worked side by side with Bill and Dave. So we set up Wi-Fi certification facilities in London and Tokyo. Uh, we ended up through the nuclear winter in 03, 06, 24 hours a day, three labs certifying. Uh, it was a $200 million worth of certification revenue as Agilent's global interoperability certification lab for Wi-Fi. So I stayed with it for two years, helped set up the labs internationally, did a lot of other things, and HP set up uh, physical air Ethernet certification, DSL digital subscriber, did a, a partnership between Olivetti and uh, Cisco and HP. It was a great ride, had a, had a big time, but it was a small um, acquisition. You know, it didn't make the front page of the uh, San Jose Mercury News, and I was the only investor. So, but I did, I did switch gears and went into financial trading for 10 years because I was always fascinated with finance. So after that, for 10 years, I was on the big island of Hawaii for two years. I was trading basically every stock option or futures contract that would hold still for five minutes, I was in there. I think I did a million shares a day in stocks every single day the market was open for six years consistently. So in the trading world, I spent a lot of time in uh, San Francisco, New York, and Chicago on the floor, um, and I took all the courses, um, to the extent there's three cutting-edge books on short-term trading that I mentioned in the forward to because I brought my knowledge from the tech world, engineering, and computer science into the independent financial trader world and did some innovation. But ultimately, I came back to high tech. It was, it was a lot of fun and very, very interesting, different career for a while there. You know, it seems like almost every entrepreneur I know at some point uh -huh. goes and does day trading or some kind of tech trading or oh yeah and long-term trading definitely works day is more it's trickier the other thing they do Absolutely. is a lot of them learn how yeah. to play poker and here yeah. we are in reno nevada uh -huh. and we get some high-end silicon valley poker is the come funnest trading yeah <laughs> head to head face to face you, you can't, can't believe that. the high-end wealthy wealthy <laughs> people will come over here and sit down and play poker once oh, in a yeah. while i know a bunch of them in fact they play like three times a week locally sure yeah it's yeah, crazy poker is such an awesome game it's great fun what a story. I'm learning more about you. Steve and I just met. Uh, you've been here about a year in Reno. What I moved to Reno on September 23rd of 2016. Yeah, live in South Reno. Mm -hmm. So what brought you to Reno? Basically, I'm starting a digital agency, and I've been experimenting with living in a tax-free state for <laughs> about seven years. <laughs> I love it. I, I, <laughs> you know, Jerry Brown, I love you. You know, you're really cool, Governor Moonbeam, but I am no longer sending you 16%. Sorry, sir. I still, pay fired. <laughs> I still pay California taxes. We have a well, business in California, but I live in Reno, so at least my military retirement It's such a great not. state. I tried Vegas for six months. Yeah. Now, that's a crazy town, but this is a lot like the town I grew up in, the air capital of the world, yeah. Wichita, Kansas. The Wichita. people are really quite similar. I love it here. It's such a friendly town. You can go anywhere in 15 minutes. And now I've discovered, thanks to you, the UNR Innovation Center. This is great. Oh, and, UNR is you know, amazing. It's top 100 schools. Wow. There's I've got lot, so lot much here. to learn about There's UNR. so much here. And we have Stitch, which is huge. I've learned a We've lot about Tesla, them. We've got Tesla, of course, Panasonic. Amazing what's going Microsoft. on out there. Tesla. And then it, what's funny is if you go up to the lake, in the, the Nevada part oh, of the lake. that's paradise. I call it paradise. Yeah. I'm it's up there every, all it's the time. It's about 30, 25 I'm minutes from where the, you live I'm riding the rim south. trail on my bike. Yeah. It's, it's awesome up there in the summertime. But what's really ironic is, you know, everything's a million, two million, three million around the lake. Yeah. 
all these people in the in Nevada side, you go in the Nevada side from California, it gets really expensive. Huh? They're all Silicon Valley people of yeah. about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Oh, and you've got half of Hollywood up there, Silicon the, Valley, yeah. everyone's up there. But yeah. they forgot, they, they haven't kept up with new technology. It's mm-hmm. changing so fast. So they're still mm-hmm. stuck 15 years Well, back. who can? I'm not even sure you and I are caught up. <laughs> <laughs> At least we know iPhones and podcasting. and Yeah, yeah. We do a lot of stuff, but technology is expanding exponentially. I like to say the future has launched a surprise attack because it's accelerating the rate of change. And a lot of the top people are worried about issues like whether artificial intelligence will end up destroying us. Um, Some wild stuff that used to be in science fiction only. And these are serious people with real concerns. So um, it's almost alarming. If you look at the last 100 years from the industrial area to today, the, the pace of acceleration. We've already had the biggest boom of wealth creation in human history in Silicon Valley. And I'll tell you, the dot-com crash in 2000 was the fake. I was going to ask you. always a fake bust. I, I believe, personally, it was also the biggest financial crime in human history, uh, totally unprosecuted. But there's always a fake boom. This is the real boom that we're in. I believe it will be sustained. It's real. I remember you just said something. I don't something. think it's a bubble. When I first met you, or the second time we spoke, you said that. You don't mm-hmm. think this is a bubble. I like that right. attitude. Well, I, it's not really based on an emotion. It's based on just understanding what happened before and what's happening now. When uh, the venture community and the investment bankers discovered around 98 or 99 that they could take you know, a bag of dog food public, the, the, the human urge – for wealth overwhelmed their ethics and they took a lot of really weak business models public in a very short time period and the american average stock purchaser was left holding the bag so you know everything collapsed but they saw that the internet was coming and they knew it was real but they rushed it and so that's natural it's a natural process this time it's a more healthy organic process and it's occurring more slowly Companies like Amazon, these are fantastic companies. This is the Sears and Roebuck of 2017, but it's even bigger. And it's better. Yeah. It's, it's better. So Way much better. Time. But, you because know, the technology. Some people haven't yeah. adopted, but most have mm-hmm. with Amazon. And it just, yeah. I mean, I actually probably consume less because of Amazon mm-hmm. because I don't go out shopping. You're the smart one. And, and I read reviews and I yeah. buy good stuff. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, wanna... it saves your time too. You don't have to go out and walk around, you know, some drugstore looking for a certain type of paperclip. You just, boom. We have a real estate step. company that we do this little publishing and printing some of my tailors. Mm-hmm. And I'm getting it like for half the price off of Amazon that we were getting it before. Fantastic. Just by a little bit of research mm-hmm. and better product, the, the materials to put together the publishing. Yeah, and, they are really a learning organization. You know, like the fifth discipline is one of my favorite business books back from 15 years ago. I used to go to a study group just for that book. And uh, Amazon is the prototypical learning adaptive organization. They just get smarter every year, yeah, and yeah. they move into new bit. Like the Whole Foods thing is going to be huge. Yeah. We I use Amazon S three in my business. Yeah, I love yeah. it. I mean, I, that's why I was talking. Well, that's talking really about speed their big these. traffic monster is yeah. all that S three. I mean, they are so good at that. Yeah, yeah that's really that's good. a huge if story. If you guys are right, have, have your head blown off or something with the tech, we're definitely into tech today, <laughs> so it's kind of fun. We're geeking out here. We're geeking it's out. Friday. Hey, what can I say? You See, know? and we're in you and R, and everyone's out. It's really nice. <laughs> exactly. Hey, Steve, one thing you led me into, we talk about books. What are your favorite books? What is your favorite book? Well, Technology-wise, I mean, entrepreneurial-wise. As far as the classics in business, if you go back 100 years, uh, Napoleon Hill wrote some definitive books on success, which I highly recommend. You know, especially the younger you can study them, the better off you'll be. But what fascinated me the most about Napoleon Hill's work was he studied the most successful people of his era. And if there's one individual I would pick that he studied, his name is Andrew Carnegie, one of the biggest philanthropers in uh, in history. So philanthropic guys, he funded the Carnegie Foundation, but he built the steel business. And Andrew Carnegie was very fond of this principle that he communicated extremely eloquently. He's, he's awesome to listen to because he speaks in current day diction. So Mr. Carnegie believed in the mastermind principle. And he said, I do not know anything about making steel to this day, but I know how to pick a person. And he assembled a mastermind to build his business. And that is the most important skill for an entrepreneur, the mastermind principle. So if you work at it, you can find his secrets and his story for success 
scattered around U.S. libraries. I have about three-fourths of them, but it is truly a masterwork. So that's going back. And then, you know, coming to the current day, I think one of the most important books that was written uh, by Mr. David Allen, who's become a friend down in Ojai, California, is called Getting Things Done. Is that the real estate, David Allen? No, so this is the GTD okay. methodology, David Allen. In 2001, when his book came out, I had sold my company. I'm sitting there in Hawaii, and it was in the front page of the Wall Street Journal. I was like, wow, this is what I'm missing. This is my frustration with too many things coming at me, too many projects. How do you ever keep on top of it all in the information age that I wanted to fix while I was out there? So I drove to Borders, picked up his book, which had just hit the shelf, and three hours later I stood up and I just inhaled it. It was like, wow. Within a week, I'm in San Francisco taking his two-day course. And, uh, you know, the ironic thing is it's not a very good book. David would tell you my first book was a disaster. But I would recommend reading the first 100 pages anyway. The ideas he came up with are earth-shattering to anyone that's involved in high technology, entrepreneurship, actually any business. You can use it if you're the burger cook at McDonald's. But not for everyone. It's a bottoms-up approach versus top-down. Now, more recently, the book that I really love is actually the complement, I believe, in my opinion, to getting things done. It's called Workflow Mastery by Karish Dini. Mr. Dini is a, a Chicago-based world-class musician, a pianist. He is a um, MD, a, a psychiatrist, so he understands how the mind works. And he is also a geek like us. He would be right here geeking out with us. He's on the OmniFocus forums. Very, very, uh, very powerful intellect. And he has cracked the other side of the equation because, as you can tell, productivity is one of my uh, pet interests, a long-term hobby uh, studying this. So what he does is he shows you how to do it, how to get into the flow to get things done so you're functioning at your top performance level and also enjoying it the most. And there's just a lot of things that we mortals don't understand about how humans think and behave. And I believe his book received all kinds of academic awards. Ironically, you can't buy the book in a bookstore. It's only available uh, as, a, I think, a dot Moby. You can't even read it on Kindle. You have to read it on the iBooks, which, by the way, is a far better book reading client. I, I like think. that. Oh, yeah. I like it's that. It's awesome. It's obscure. Yeah. This guy is amazing. I, I just love his work. So it's, it's 900 pages of very tedious reading, and some people <laughs> will think it's over-intellectualizing. No. I study it like it was a religious text. It's really powerful stuff. So those are probably my two current day favorites. But I read probably at least 100 books on the average year. I listen to uh, Audible. Uh, I'm probably my mission on the planet, in addition to being – as good a dad as possible, is constantly to learn new things every day. And my friend uh, Brad Feld, the venture capitalist out in Boulder, we discovered we have the same mission, to constantly learn. And, you know, it sounds like an unproductive thing, but, you know, it makes life really fun and it leads to a lot of uh, great opportunities. And I seem to be kind of built for it. Well, we're so. going to take a two-minute break. Uh, okay. Commercial break, actually. I'll throw something in here. This is the old timeline. I think I used up my time already. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to clap. <laughs> Hi, this is Bill, and I just wanted you to go on over to eosecrets.com and check out what I've been working on. You know, I've interviewed over 500 people in podcasting. I've started shows. They've gone new and noteworthy. They've monetized. But I'll tell you what. What I found is most people don't monetize, even with affiliate marketing, which is tough and rollover. So, Look at eosecrets.com and see if it's something that you might be able to monetize your podcast with or your website. Take care, and let's get right back to the episode with Steve. Okay, welcome back to Timelines. Second part here, we're going to go into Steve's life and success principles, and we'll sort of wrap up. We went, along, we went a little long in one. And uh, Steve, the first life and success principle say, take care of your business, and it will take care of you. What does that mean to you? Well, that actually comes from my father, George Bell, who was a six-year U.S. Navy veteran. And uh, he liked to say, take care of your business, and it will take care of you. And I've never heard anything more true. So it means don't let things slip out of control. Be on top of your details. Actually, I like to be about two weeks ahead of my business. When I start hearing it chasing me, there's trouble coming. So you need to really be on top of things. But boy, are the rewards immense. 
Very good. So if uh, if you're not five minutes early, you're late. I love this one. Well, the thing is, I learned this the hard way. There's a very senior guy and uh, you know, we were sitting in a coffee house and I asked him for some corrective feedback and he said, you know, when you show up late, and I called him and said, hey, sorry I'm late, man. I, I, there's traffic over here on the 280. And it had happened a couple of times over the past three years. He said, the thing is, when you show up late, you're disrespecting me. And when you have a reason, that's not good. So what you do is when you're late, you know, try to call him and tell him your arrival time from your GPS, but it should never happen. You just say three words, I am late. And what that does, you have ownership. You're not trying to pass it off onto the traffic or any other excuse. So I am late. And I try to minimize the number of times a year that I say those three words, but it is a big confidence builder from your business associates. And actually, if someone's late to meet me, I don't call them and remind them about our meeting. It's good information to know because here's the thing. The top people, if you'll notice, the A players, they are not late. True. They are true. in control of a military guy. I'll bet you those guys are five minutes early. You no, know, I've always run seven or eight real estate agents, and you mm -hmm. haven't been around real estate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, showing and all the things that they have to do. They're constantly coordinating and checking stuff. Appointments. But we tell yeah. them to call people ahead of time to make sure everyone's there because their time, they're, well, they're very busy. Now, I'm operating in the top tiers of Silicon Valley right. most of my career where this is like there are certain unwritten rules that probably aren't followed as well across all industries, but in the Silicon Valley A tier, you are on time, period. Right. It's military. Right. You know, and no, if no, you are I, not on time, you're losing credibility and reputation. It's not good. You know, I didn't do this. I don't think we have enough time, but I was going to talk about Moore's Law. That brought up Silicon Valley again. Uh-huh. Well, yeah. Well, maybe if we get time, we'll talk about Moore's sure, Law. Sure, yeah. It's at the an end interesting here. law. Yeah. Because so I think of Silicon Valley. Um, so, uh, third question always answer the question. That is one I really like because it's so simple. And if you're a burger flipper down at the local fast food restaurant, this will help you in your business. If you're a mom, but especially if you're in business. So, you know, they say, Steve, you know, what do you think will be the date that that shipment arrives? You know, and you don't go, well, you know, it might be next Wednesday, but I'm going to check with the UPS tracker. It could take till Thursday. No. What you want to do when you get asked a question in business is you might need to ask for more time. You might explain that you don't know, but usually you just answer the question head on. You want to do the opposite of what a really good politician does. They pivot and then they give you an answer that you didn't ask the question for. So you never want to miss the question. You, if you can hit the question right in the center of the bullseye, people will change how they react to you. But there is a downside your boss and probably your boss's boss is going to start bringing more things to you because you will be trusted. So if you answer the question, that is direct credibility building. But never make a commitment you can't meet. So when you answer the question, just stick to the answer and be careful whenever you're making a commitment about some delivery. So there's a tendency, if you can answer the question, to go beyond it and get into new commitments. Just a clean answer to the question and no more is a really good thing. And it will take you far in any business. That's definitely a military concept in is war, it? especially. You have to be, uh, you have to answer the question to the best of your ability. That might be the order. Clear, as clear as possible because of the chain of command in the well, military. People's lives American depend on it. business uh, operating principles came out of the military. It's a real hierarchical command and control. So a lot of the principles from the military are the best stuff you can adopt for business. I've heard the traditional manufacturing, traditional businesses have evolved. That's, they use the military structure where we could go into discussion on this. I don't well, know about Google business, and modern yeah, business, there's, yeah, there's a lot of positive changes that have happened, but I know the military has changed too. Right. So, you know, you can't always take something from the past and apply it today because, you know, expectations right. were different. Things evolve. I agree. One thing yeah. I would add to that maybe, if you answer a direct question, but I would like to clarify or say maybe following up with a clarification what exactly yes. – the ramifications are. That's good. That's called engagement. That means they liked your answer and they want to learn more. That's the best thing that can happen. And then answer it directly. Very good. Don't convert your friends and business people to business people. Right. Like if you're in a job and you become friends with the people you're working with, that's all good. You know, it's healthy. Uh, it's a positive. But 
if you have friends, don't pull them into your business. Now, this is just my personal style that I've learned from making mistakes. Because whenever I have a mistake, one of my Bell's rules, I have about 500 rules in a database that I've slowly accumulated. So whenever there's a mistake or something bad happens, um, you can feel bad about it. You know, that lasts about five minutes and does absolutely no good. What I try to do is find what caused the mistake that I owned and then see if I need to create a new rule to fix it. Because, you know, you'll make mistakes repeatedly until life teaches you that it's not working and you change. Why not just try to get the lesson right away and that way you can operate with less friction and less problems. So I'm looking for the lesson in there that I can extract from any bad situation. Usually you can find it by looking in a mirror. It's funny how that works. So with with friends, it's highly likely there's going to be bad things happen if you pull your friends into your business. Not always true. And there's a lot of good family businesses. But um, with a friend, for example, like I'm going to come to UNR and recruit interns for our agency. Um, they're going to be strictly a professional relationship. So if it doesn't work out, I can say, sorry, you know, here's the reason. Goodbye. If it's a friend, you know, they're mad for life. So you can't do business in a healthy way with friends. I totally understand that, especially with employees too, because yeah. sometimes you might have to fire people. Yeah. Um, I've been in family businesses from, we never fire family. <laughs> it just doesn't you happen. You can't. But sometimes we set them up doing different things. And yeah, I, send I've them seen to it. Siberia. Yeah, there's yeah. creative ways to do that too. <laughs> and my wife is running a real estate division and it's, it's unique. It takes a special well, talent. We could for talk, her anyway, right? We could talk about family businesses. <laughs> but friends, um, I think I follow with what you said. But when I think of friends, I, I probably only have a handful of very close friends. Mm -hmm. Most people are that way. And, for example, um, in high school, Jeff Dahl, who's an architect, uh, San Luis Obispo. Oh, cool. Wonderful architect. I've had him do some work for me. Mm -hmm. But it's contract, individual work. Uh, and we've thought about working together, but we haven't. I mean, we've done. he's done some project work for me. But, you know. And I've seen him make some big mistakes when he went off in development. Yeah. But we've never developed, I'm a developer builder type thing, in my old day at least. But I can relate to that. And I think one of the reasons why I didn't, even though I really like Jack, I love his work. I'll have him design my, my home yeah. here. I, my company actually has a design cell in it. Uh -huh. But I'm at the point now where he's going to do my next home, not, cool. not internal. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I can relate to that because I think that's why Jeff and I never really got together in that aspect is because we're close friends. Mm -hmm. And I would never want to uh, threaten that relationship. Far more important than some business venture. Yeah. yeah. But most people you meet, you like, but they're not real friends. They're professional acquaintances yeah. is what I call them, and some which people, is good. Some people develop very close friendships, though, through the military or through long-term business. And that's all good. Yeah. yeah. If you're in a business already and someone becomes a personal friend, great. Yeah. Yeah, Very good. Those don't tend to go wrong because you're already working together successfully. That's a really good point. That's a really good point. Okay, number five is don't try to impress people. Two of my favorite actors are Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee. And in the original Fugitive, he chases them down and they're at the end of a big tunnel and he's going to have to jump. And uh, Harrison Ford says, but I didn't murder my wife. I'm innocent. And Tommy Lee clearly knows he's really innocent. But he has the 44 and he says, I don't care. <laughs> but Harrison Ford makes that magnificent leap. So I try to be like that. I don't care. And this comes naturally as you uh, age a little, I think, for most people. But it's not an arrogance like, I don't care what you think. It's not like that. It's just like where you're coming from is, I don't really care if you like me or not. I'm not trying to impress you. Just be authentic is what it really means. Yeah. Don't worry about what someone else is thinking because it really doesn't matter. And guess what? They don't care. That's true. People care more about themselves and their family. I think. That's what they're thinking about. And that's normal. It's okay. So people get a distorted uh, impression and they act. They're not real because they're trying to impress. So it's really the whole wrong place to come from. But it's also very helpful. Your life will become a lot simpler and less stressful. Very good. Now and you guess what? It's more impressive to be real. That's why we love the actors, because when they get into a character, it's like they're real. So authenticity is the way to go. Yeah. Very good. So, Steve, you had a sixth. What was the sixth? I think that it's really important when you're in business, whether you're uh, a peer on a team or managing people or trying to build an organization, to always lead by example. So 
If you go into the office at 9.30 and work till 4, your organization will mimic it. If you go in at 6 o'clock and work, you know, till 5.30 or 6, you'll find your people doing that. And everything you do, it's like a child and a parent, is going to be mimicked. So when a corporation is formed, it develops a personality just like a human being. So I can tell you what the personality of IBM is, Cisco, uh, any, any tech company that I know, Google, remarkable company. Uh, I love studying them. <laughs> uh, but it's from the founders. They actually established the genetic footprint for the corporate culture and perpetuate it, and then it grows into something bigger, like Bill and David HP. It's alive today. They're immortal because they created this awesome culture. So, you know, when you're building a company, whether it's going to be 10 people or 10,000, you are creating the blueprint for that company's DNA. So you must act with integrity and consistency and set the example for everything. What happens when a supplier makes you angry? How do you handle it? They will do the same thing. And everything you do is important. How do you celebrate successes? How do you handle failure? Um, it's all in the culture. I attempted to create the first grouch-free startup back in uh, 2012, 13. I was raising venture capital. And it's actually done already by the most successful startups. Um, and some of the venture community adopted it. I was giving out a little yellow book called How to Be Successful. It's called The Power of Nice. How to Be Successful Without Being a Total Jerk. Because it's a myth that the the pushy, brash, angry people are more successful, a total myth in business. I can go on, on for three hours about that. Um, you don't have to be a rollover or too easy. You can give constructive feedback, but it doesn't have to be nasty or angry. I do not believe in the whole authoritarian, angry thing. I think it's out of date and it's unhealthy and toxic. So most of your successful startups are the same 25 or 30 people that have started other successful companies. They know how to work together, and guess what? They genetically reject angry, grouchy people. And who wants to be about, around an angry person? So, you know, an example would be to have a wholesome, positive attitude and to create cool things and to build really neat stuff and have some fun along the way. So that's the example I would set in the culture of the company. Well, in finishing up, we're going to ask a couple of questions. Um, I thought of a lot of other questions I could ask you, but we're going to wrap it up. We'll have you back some uh, soon. Uh -huh. But what I want to ask you is about a couple of things. Reno, you're new in Reno, been here yeah. a year. Mm -hmm. If I come to Reno, where should I go to eat? Well, I'm actually not a foodie. Like, you know, I like Thai food, um, mm -hmm. but really, you know, being from Wichita, I'd love a good burger. So Reno is a, a great burger town, and I love the Lucky Beaver. They have this uh, cured beef that, so basically if you get the good meat, uh -huh. uh, it's $25 north for a single hamburger. It's right in front of the Atlantis okay. Casino on, uh, by the Outback Steakhouse. Okay. So there's probably a half dozen really great burger places in Reno. Lucky Beaver. I've never been in there, uh -huh. but right across, I know right where it is. Yeah. It's like a sports bar, but the big thing is their hamburgers. Very good. Yeah. So if I'm in Silicon Valley, which uh -huh. you lived for a few years, where should we go to eat? I would go to San Francisco and go to the oldest restaurant in America, yeah. the Tadish Grill. I lived right around the corner for five years. And, uh, you know, it was there in 06 when the earthquake happened and survived. So this politician goes in there and the, his arc rival enemy was in there. And the one guy says to the other, the day you're elected mayor of San Francisco, hell will freeze over. So, of course, he was elected, and there's a famous <laughs> picture of the front. He had hired two dump trucks, and they, they closed the door off with two dump trucks full of ice while the guy was in there. <laughs> so hell froze over on that day. It's run by a bunch of uh, Greek guys. It's a family, and it's just a marvelous experience. What's the name again? Uh, the Tadish Grill, T-A-D-I-C-H. It's right there Grill. in the financial district okay. right off of Battery Street. Off of Battery, okay. I think it's on Pine. Yeah, you can find it. It's a historic uh, facility. One thing I love yeah. to do uh -huh. is when people mention these places, I'm there, I go and eat there. Cool. I do that all the time wherever I I think go. you'll like the Tadish, but report back. I haven't been there in a few years. Yeah. Well, Steve, I thank you for coming on today. I know you're a busy guy, and we made this. It was this. fun. Yeah, and you too. you're going to do do a go and run around this facility real fast and see what it's all Love about. Love to see it. Yeah. And this is the very first podcast um, here at the Innovation Center, UNR Innovation Center. We hope to do more. 
it's an exciting place. They actually have a podcast studio downstairs. Yeah, I was involved at Cal Poly Slow when they were establishing their innovation center, and I found it very interesting and exciting. This looks like a great one here, but I'm looking forward to the tour. That's good. All right, thank you, Steve. You bet. This is Bill, and if you could go over right about here and subscribe, I'd just really appreciate it if you're on YouTube. If you're on iTunes, please go to the iTunes account and subscribe. Subscriptions really help. Leave your comments and reviews. It's wonderful stuff to do. So thank you for listening in to timelinesofsuccess.com. I want to thank Steve and the UNR Innovation Center.